Before we discuss the kinds of studies epidemiologists conduct, we're going to cover some terms, concepts, ideas, and tools they use. We already learned that epidemiologists describe or define a population. Why is it important to define a population? Ask yourself this. If group A has 100 sick people, while group B has 300 sick people, can you tell which group has the greater frequency of the disease? The answer is no. The number of sick people in groups A and B only re represent the outcome. You don't know how large the population of group A or group B is, or over how long a period of time these people got sick. So while it may seem that group B is being affected to a much greater degree by the disease, that is not necessarily the case. What if group A has a total population of only 200, while group B has a total population of 3,000? Further, what if all of the 100 sick people in group A became sick over a one-year period, while the 300 sick people in group B became sick over a 30-year period? After better defining the population, you see clearly that group A is being affected to a much greater degree by the disease. This is an important distinction for epidemiologists to make, so that scarce resources can be devoted to target populations most in need. As illustrated in the last example, the frequency of disease depends on the number of people affected by the disease, that is, the number of cases the total size of the population, and the length of time that the population is studied. Ratios, proportions, and rates are used to develop statistics and identify and illustrate the extent of public health problems. Ratios consist of one number divided by another number when the two numbers are unrelated. An example is the ratio of male to female births in 2014. Proportions also involve the division of two numbers, but the two numbers are related, meaning that the numerator, the top number, is a subset of the denominator, the lower number. An example is the proportion of males born in New York State in 2014, divided by the number of live births in New York State in 2014. Proportions are usually reported as percentages. So the proportion of Sage College students who have ever taken a public health course is the number of students that have ever taken a public health course divided by the total number of students enrolled at Sage College. Though I don't have the exact numbers on hand, the proportion could be 60 students to 600 students, which equals 10%. Rates also involve dividing two numbers, but the denominator always relates to time. A rate we're all familiar with is driving speed, say 55 miles per hour. In another example, the incidence rate of Lyme disease in Albany County, New York was 115 per 100,000 in the population between 2010 and 2012. Two basic concepts are used to describe the frequency of disease in a population, incidence and prevalence. Incidence is the frequency of new cases of the disease divided by the entire population under study, while prevalence is the frequency of all existing disease divided by the entire population under study. The distinction between the two concepts is very important. For example, the incidence or number of new cases of HIV in the United States has greatly decreased since the 1980s and 90s. This is because public health has identified the ways the virus spreads, has educated the population on how to avoid contracting the virus, and has developed numerous prevention programs. However, the prevalence, the number of all existing cases, has been increasing in the new millennium because people who have HIV are living longer. Prevalence is high because the field of medicine has identified ways to successfully treat the virus and prevent its progression to full-blown AIDS. The field of public health has developed prevention education programs as well as programs to increase access to treatment for those with HIV. Furthermore, public health promotes adherence to treatment regimens 
as in directly observed therapy, for people taking medications for TB. You'll recall that having TB is associated with contracting HIV. So while the incidence or number of new cases of HIV in New York State in 2014 was pretty low, the prevalence or number of all cases was pretty high. It's important to use both concepts to properly target interventions that address disease outbreaks as well as states of chronic disease. As we discussed earlier, a key activity of epidemiologists is surveillance. Surveillance is defined as the ongoing systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of outcome-specific data. Surveillance, simply put, is a standard monitoring. It's how we know about disease and injuries in any given area. It's very important that surveillance is followed by action. Surveillance must be closely connected to timely dissemination of data to professionals who can do something about the problem, that is, those responsible for preventing and controlling disease or injury. What's meant by timely action varies by disease. For example, information about meningitis needs to be disseminated right away, while for cancer, timely can mean a month or six months. There are two types of surveillance you should be familiar with active and passive surveillance. Health departments waiting for reports on occurrences of disease is an example of passive surveillance. Professionals going out into the field to find data on occurrences of disease is an example of active surveillance. Active surveillance is expensive, but it results in more quality data. Epidemiology does much more than just monitor disease. It also describes disease and analyzes the causes of disease so that actions can be taken to prevent future occurrences. Epidemiologists often lack the resources to investigate entire populations and have to design smaller scale studies. They select samples of the population that represent the larger populations of interest. Studies of the population are descriptive or analytic. The purpose of descriptive studies, as the term suggests, is to describe the health status of populations according to person, place, and time. In other words, it's the who, what, where, and when of the disease. In descriptive studies, epidemiologists do not test specific hypotheses as to which exposure, secondhand smoke for example, increases or decreases outcome or occurrence of the disease, lung cancer for example. Testing hypotheses is the purpose of analytic studies. Analytic studies advance knowledge of what causes a disease, known as the etiology of the disease. Analytic studies answer the question, why? There are different types of analytic studies. They have specific purposes, require varying levels of resources to conduct, and they raise different ethical issues. Epidemiologists have to choose which design is most appropriate for each case they investigate. They have to take into account the potential for error and bias each one entails, as well as the resources available. First we'll look at different types of error and bias. Then we'll examine the various types of studies and how each eliminates potential error and bias. Whereas laboratory investigations are highly controlled, Epidemiology deals with living human populations, and therefore epidemiologic investigations are much less controlled. As a result, they are often prone to error. Epidemiologists seek to eliminate or reduce error to provide results that are valid and meaningful. Error is the discrepancy between the observed result and the true value. There are two types of error random error, and systematic error. Random error happens by chance or by unforeseeable forces that have no known cause. The association being studied between exposure and disease goes in a random direction which leads to imprecise results. Imagine a dartboard. If you are precise at your aim at throwing darts, your darts land around the same spot on each throw. This does not mean that they are all in the bullseye, though. You may be way off the target, 
but you consistently throw your darts up to the same spot. With random error, however, your dart throwing is imprecise and the darts land all over the board in an unpredictable pattern. Random error may be reduced by increasing the size of the sample you include in your study or improving your measurement instruments. Systematic error, on the other hand, is not due to unforeseen forces, but to error in the design or co conduct of the study. It alters the association between exposure and disease in a specific direction, which leads to biased results. Systematic error is more of a problem than random error. Epidemiologists have to evaluate the potential for bias and how it may impact their study. There are two types of bias which we'll cover, selection bias and information bias. Selection bias is the systematic error resulting from how participants are selected for inclusion into the study. Remember, epidemiologists rarely study the entire population and must select a sample of participants for their study who represent the larger population affected by the disease. Bias can be introduced based on who's selected and retained in a study. Selection bias exists, for example, if those who are selected or retained are less likely to be ill than those who are not. For selection bias, consider a survey that is looking for the effects of screening on breast cancer outcomes. Women who are found to have breast cancer but have positive outcomes due to screening and early detection may be more likely to self-select and complete the survey. They feel strongly about the benefits of being screened. Women who are sick or hospitalized due to breast cancer, whether or not they were screened, may be less likely to participate in the survey. For retention bias, consider these same women when they're followed up with another survey later in the study. Those who had poorer outcomes and were screened are more likely than those who were not screened to drop out and just not complete the study. In this example, both selection and retention bias result in a survey heavily weighted toward healthier women. It's important for epidemiologists to get a high participation or response rate to be sure of getting a balanced sample and to retain as many participants as possible. There can still be a problem even if selection and retention bias is minimized. Information bias can still creep in. People in one group may be more accurate in remembering exposure to a risk factor. For example, women who had children with birth defects may be more likely to remember drinking alcohol during pregnancy than women who gave birth to healthy children. This is recall bias. To minimize recall bias, epidemiologists use methods such as memory cards and calendars. Interviewer bias is another kind of information bias. Using the last example, when an interviewer knows the woman he is interviewing has given birth to a child with a birth defect, this knowledge may bias the way he records the level of the pregnant woman's drinking. Epidemiologists can keep interviewers ignorant of the hypothesis being studied to minimize this type of bias.